going to have a couple of songs to sing. One is Love Came Down, and the second is The Power of Your Love. These are both wonderful songs. I think they tell us about uh, the love of God. And we're going to be taking a look at the particular way that God loves us uh, as part of our worship theme this morning. So join me as we sing these two songs. My heart is overwhelmed And I cannot hear your voice I hold on to what is true Though I cannot see If the storms of life they come And the road ahead gets deep I will lift these hands in faith I will
I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Hold me close, let your love surround. words about God's love for us. And this morning, I'd like for us to take a look at the idea of our life with God. In particular, <clears throat> that's the title of the message. You can find uh, our text in John chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through uh, verse 2 of chapter 2, our life with God. Now, <clears throat> this relates to the subject of fellowship, and I don't know, um, I th hope that we'll get at a little better definition of the word fellowship than, than it just being potlucks, although this makes me want one of our famous potlucks, 
It does, and I keep thinking, maybe we could just do this out at Louisville and have our potluck <clears throat> or bring your own, you know, bring your own meal. See, I'm still working on that. But um, it, the subject of fellowship it was mentioned in the first part of um, the text that we looked at last Sunday, and it will appear again. We find in 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 through 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, this idea of fellowship. The word fellowship uh, that come, let's see, comes to us to, today from, from the uh, original text is the word koinonia. Uh, you've maybe heard that word before, koinonia. Koinonia has to do with something held in common. Fellowship, um, you know, it's, people have said fellowship is two guys in the same ship, but they might not have it. Have anything in common. <laughs> Fellowship is what we hold in common, something that we hold together. It's mutual interest in. We share things together. Our, our, our being together is around um, a common thing. Other words that we sometimes include are the idea of communion, where people are in communion with each other and with God. It's a close relationship, and therefore, it, fellowship is a highly relational term. It includes, it includes relationships between persons and what those persons hold in common. Fellowship, then, is the essence of the Christian life, fellowship with God and fellowship with Christ, uh, each other or believers in Christ. So let's take a look at our text and you're welcome to read along with me. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. There are three times in this passage, and you probably noted that, that John says, if we claim this, and he introduces every time he says, if we claim something, something that he believes to be false or wrong. These are the things that he addresses in verse 6, 8, and 10. Claiming to have fellowship with God while living the dark life, claiming to be without sin, and claiming to have not sinned. Those are the claims. Now, G, uh, John's audience had been uh, hearing some false teachings. We talked a little bit about this uh, last Sunday. Uh, some false teachings, in particular about sin. These uh, Gnostic teachers had come in with the idea that um, sin really didn't affect a person's relationship with God because 
Spirit is the only thing that counts. And, uh, and so these sinful bodies, you know, they, they, they sin because they are um, material. But our spirits are okay. And this is one thing that he's speaking to. Some said that this, the, what would you call the sinful nature was dead and that people could become completely sinless. And so you can see that was another thing that he was address, ad addressing. Others actually denied the existence of sin. And when we talk about sin, it's basically this idea that God has great intent and loving intent for you and for me. And God knows the best way possible for us to li live. And so sin is when we, we miss that great intent. We miss the mark that God is setting for us for the good life. So that's what he's talking about here. Sin is real, he says. All people experience it. And there is a distinguishment. A dis he does distinguish between people who, who, who fall and get up and go ahead again with Christ and people who just simply their whole lifestyle is, never changes. It never changes from, um, uh, to, to become more and more like Christ. So the bottom line that John is um, uh, giving to his readers and to us today is that we have to deal with this thing called sin. If we were capable of living without it, without sin, then Jesus wouldn't have had to have died for us. You see how, how linked, in intricately linked we are with this, with what Jesus provides for us. We wouldn't need to confess wrong, and um, we really wouldn't need Christ if that were the truth. But in reality, we stand before God, um, fallen and broken as human beings, need, needing to be purified from sin. And fortunately, God has made a way for you and me. One of the beginning points that he mentions here is if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So that's kind of the context in which we find these words. Now I'd like to just go briefly back through these words. You, you can read them. Is, is there anything that stands out to you or you have a question about? Yes. It's a, it's a very interesting word that he uses here about walking in the light. Um, have you ever heard of a walkabout? Uh, that people in Australia go on these long walkabouts? Well, it's close in meaning to that. The word literally means, it, it, it's, it's called, it, the word is peripateo, and it means to walk about, to walk around. And here, um, obviously, it's talking about a lifestyle, a way of life. Not, not just a, a life that's descriptive, but a life that's active. It has that very, very kind of thing. If we walk in the light, which is um, in the present tense, and if we go about walking in the light, is he is in the light, is, is the idea. Now, it's interesting. It says, first, God is light, right? God is light, and in him is, there is no darkness at all. God is, is, is light. It, notice it, he didn't say, 
the light is like God. It's saying God is light. And by that we understand it means to, to show all that is right and true um, and life-giving. The light does that. It, it shows what is true, what's real, and what um, is right. Darkness is, is quite another thing. I remember a person talking about uh, going with a group out to the Grand Canyon, and they, it was just a spur of the moment. They were headed uh, back to California, but they, they decided in the middle of the night they wanted to wake up in the morning and see the Grand Canyon. And so they made this great big uh, jaunt down to the canyon, and they hoped they were, they were about in the right place. So they got out of the car, and they all kind of pulled the sleeping bags out and went to sleep. And when they woke up in the morning, this one person who was talking about it said, I was, I was literally at arm's length from a 500-foot drop. <laughs> when, when we're in the dark, spiritually speaking, we have no idea how, what, what dangers are there. Uh, we have no idea how, uh, what would you call it? We could be, uh, our, how in peril our souls are. But when we are walking in the light, God's light, uh, what God shows on us, he, he would show us the, the way to walk. We would learn um, what's better. Not only, not only what's better, but sometimes we learn what's best for us. So, um, and that's, that's what it means to be walking, I think, in the light. Walking, that is, we see what God wants, we agree with God about what God wants for our lives. We say yes to it, and then we begin trying to implement that. The point of this text is that sometimes we don't get it right. Sometimes we, we don't get it right. Sometimes we are uh, willful little beings and choose the wrong. Sometimes we, coming out of spiritual darkness, have all kinds of things to learn about walking in the light. And those two are areas where God shows us. You've, you, you've, you've been going this way, but I think I've got a better way for you to go. And we become aware of that. And saying yes in those moments is walking in the light. Um, I think one thing that he's addressing here is that... Um, we be walking where God is. He says, God is light. He's going to be showing us the truth. To walk in darkness is, again, to put ourselves at peril. To put ourselves in darkness would, could, could be described this way behaviorally. We are not, not walking where God is. We can get to the point where we just shut God down. Maybe you've seen that happen. Anytime a person says, this Christian life is just too difficult, and I've, I've, I've failed too many times, I give up. So I'm going to play this out as I see it. Now, this person could have a relationship, could initially have a relationship with Christ, could have received uh, the gift of uh, the Holy Spirit, but they, for one reason or another, they just shut down. In essence, they, be, they live as if God is not. This is what uh, one person calls practical atheism. 
we are practically atheists because we live as if God is not. We don't want the light shining in. And so uh, to walk in the light is to walk where God is, be saying yes to God. I'm going to move into the, the message part. If something else comes up as we're going through here, you're welcome to raise your hand. Okay. The first thing um, is a description of our life with God. What is it? It's living as a child of light. And our foundation is this. The message that we have heard from him, we declare to you. Remember in the, in the previous part, John basically said to his readers, I was there. I saw him. I listened to him. I even touched him. So I'm telling you what I heard from him. And that message is being passed down to you and to me. It's in a long line of um, uh, faithful people who have shared this good news that God has called us um, to be with him. Our focal point in this is God who is light. And there is no darkness at all in him. This is so different from the, the, the idea of, uh, especially the Gnostic idea. The Gnostic idea was that very often um, there's, there's good and there's bad, there's evil and um, good or truth. There is spirit, there is matter. Uh, they they, they uh, divided things up like, uh, like that. We know that in, for example, some mid, um, uh, Mideastern concepts, um, this is uh, the idea that, that darkness and light are balanced. It's kind of like the old Star Wars uh, and the Force. You know, I've sensed that there's an imbalance in the Force. Uh, evil, you know, it's, or, or the, the evil ones would say, I've sensed an imbalance in the force because there are, are, there's good happening out there. But this, this is, isn't the, uh, the idea that John gives. It is not that good and evil are balanced or unbalanced. It's that, that the, the supreme good is God who is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. There's nothing dark about God. God is goodness. He, he's where we get our idea of goodness and truth and life. So that's what he's beginning to address here is the uh, focal point. God as light where there is no darkness in him at all. And then he talks about our fellowship in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, who would you imagine uh, qualifies to be in that category, one another? We have fellowship with one another. Who are the one another's? Believers. Believers who hold in common... Remember the coin, the fellowship, who hold in common this uh, Savior, and they hold in common the gift of a God of light. So it would, it would include that, yes. Fellowship with God, absolutely. There is fellowship with God. There's fellowship with each other. There's fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, who is also mentioned in these texts. In another place, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, God is faithful who has called you into the fellowship, into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So the son's in the picture here. 
The Holy Spirit is also in this picture. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So there's this great company that we're in in terms of fellowship as we walk as children of light. And so we have a friendship. We also have forgiveness. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. This is something that is remarkable to me. I come back to it time and time again to ponder the love of God uh, and how God has communicated to human beings that he loves. And he, he, he loves us even though we are so broken and has, has created, for example, in the Old Testament, um, the sacrificial system was to be a giant learning, um, a giant illustration of the expense of sin or the costliness of sin. Um, and that carried on into the New Testament where Jesus, because of his absolute purity, could die for you and me, that his blood would be shed for you and me uh, for our forgiveness. The blood of, his, of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, I don't know if that sounds like a one-time thing of the word purify, what do, you, what do you take from that word? Does that sound like a one-time thing? Well said. That's it. It's present. It's active. It indicates what God is doing for you and for me um, repetitively. This is good news, isn't it? This is really good news to remember. There are times when we f forget and we, we um, obsess and or, um, yes, we obsess about our sin. And if we hold up to our mind's eye that his blood purifies and is purifying us from all sin, uh, we have hope to make some progress, I think. So next, he talks about what it's not. Our life with God is not living in darkness. There were those who uh, were making a profession of being friends of Christ. But here's one of those statements. If we claim to have fellowship with him, we can't live in darkness, live in the dark. We cannot live as if God is not. It's a choice that... Um, puts us on a whole new path and it's a positive and a good, good path. Secondly, it is not um, a life bent toward the twilight, I would call it. <laughs> if we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in darkness, if that's our bent, if that's how, we, how our lives are, are, are typically going, we need to have a time out with God because that's not, that's not going to get us anywhere. And in fact, it will, we will dry up spiritually if we do that. We will dry up spiritually. And there are some other things that our text says will happen. The third thing is um, we lie. Living in darkness as followers of Christ, we're going to have to uh, create a, a different scenario, 
primarily for ourselves. We all get into talk, self-talk with it, ourselves. And if we are shutting off the voice of the Holy Spirit, our self-talk, we're, we're going to have to convince ourselves that this is somehow okay. So we end up, we have to end up lying to ourselves. We develop a need to distort reality, with this life with God, if we follow the darkness. And there is a disorientation, I think, in, even in the darkness. Like I told you about the man who laid down an arm's length from a 500-foot drop. We, we, we get disoriented in the darkness, and, we, and so the, 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 the behavioral effect is that we do not live by the truth. So what's the problem here? These were Christians, and Christians can... He's speaking to Christians. Christians who've established a relationship with God. They've come into the family of God by faith in Christ. That means that at one point they were experiencing the full life of the Spirit. But now, there is no sign of life in their lives. They do not live according to the truth. Their lives can become the opposite. We could turn out harsh, loveless, critical, demanding of others. And these are themes that John picks up throughout First John. That those who walk in the light grow in love and esteem for others and have a care about their brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, when it talks about Walking in darkness. I don't know if some of you initially thought of that as just just sinning, of do uh, let's see, doing certain things that are wrong and not doing things that are right. But walking in darkness isn't a synonym for sinning. We sin as a result of walking in darkness, living as if God is not. And you see, there's the root of the thing. We've, we've left a relationship that bears light into our lives, and that's why things go south in our behavior. That's the problem. Darkness is simply the absence of light, and that's what John means here. To walk in darkness means to walk as though there were no God. Practical atheism. So it's possible to be a Christian and yet turn God off. John starts with this problem because it's the most, I think, widespread and common of problems Christians face. right here, life with God, or life with God. You can miss the benefits of God's presence in your life by ignoring the light. How do we do that? Well, one thing I, I've thought about with this um, COVID thing is that some of us could develop habits of not gathering here when we restart. Because gathering right here, there are people who bear witness of the light into my life. Their life speaks to me about the truth as they try to live um, the Christian life. And so that's one of my concerns, that we... Um, don't 
developed habit of, of just walking away from all this. This is too important. Um, another thing is that we could just simply um, ignore um, the light that is in God's word that shows us God's way and will and God's love. How can we end up in darkness? Uh, we, we could get, develop the habit of never stopping to examine ourselves and see if we are in the light. Yes? Yes. So for those of you who could, maybe couldn't hear, she's underscoring the importance of friendships and how they can speak into your life when they see something that is going awry. And that's so true. That's so true. We, we need that. Uh, we need people in our lives to help us. And I, I mentioned also never stopping to examine ourselves, never asking searching questions about where we are in the Christian life. It's important for us to do that so that we can remain in the light. But how does this how does this happen and what does it begin to look like? Well, it begins to look like this. Um, it's a, we get diverted from our life with God through the following ways. One is to deny our sinfulness, like, like a, a pretending till we talk our conscience quiet, you know, or, or talk the sweet, small voice of the Holy Spirit um, silent. And he responds, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's very interesting. Uh, you notice this is a singular. It isn't, it isn't plural. And when he says, if we claim to be without sin instead of sins, it's that he's talking about there's something about human beings that is broken. And, it, and it's in, within. And there's nobody who's, who's gotten delivered yet from this thing. This bent toward the wrong. If we claim to be without that capacity, we are kidding ourselves. So it's important always to have a healthy, I'm going to use the word fear of what's in us and, and about where it could go. Um, and certainly not to just simply deny, or deny it. So he, you can see here um, how he's, he talks about it's lying starts primarily to ourselves. We deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. A second thing um, that I would like to say, and it kind of speaks to this thing about uh, you talked about with your friend, of that friendship being so important and this fellowship being so important. Um, I'm going to read a quote to you um, about, about, about this dynamic that I think you'll identify with. What joy... What relief, what sheer dramatic relief it has been to get rid of all this posturing, this pretending, and admit that I have problems, and have people pray for me, even though they've been Christians for years, and to feel the burden of pretense roll away so that I am just free to be what I am, 
be what I'm becoming, knowing that they share this in common with me. That's fellowship. That's something that we hold in common. We hold in common our brokenness. And we also hold in common our Savior. There is also a sense that we could be perpetuating a culture of denial. This is um, something that's very easy to do. Where we behave as if Everything's just ducky. <laughs> and we don't process with our brothers and sisters the um, issues of the heart. So we end, up, we end up basically denying that our sinfulness matters. If we claim that we have not sinned. It, if we're doing that, then we are portraying two other followers of Christ, a distorted view of spirituality. That's exactly what these people were doing in John's day. It was a distorted view of spirituality if we claim we have not sinned. It says we make God out to be a liar. Uh, it slanders God's character. God is bearing witness to you and me of our need for a Savior. And to say we don't sin or we haven't sinned um, or sin doesn't matter basically stands toe-to-toe with God and says, you know, I disagree. That's where you end up practically. And it places our opinion then above God's truth. It says his word has no place in our lives. He's been bearing witness to you and me about our need for him and it shows his word has no place in our lives. Well, how do we resume our walk with God? We start by aiming higher. We want to aim higher. First, by owning our sin, being honest with ourselves and being honest with God. That's literally what the word confess means. It's, it means to say the same thing. To say the same thing. To say the same thing as God is saying. Say, I agree. You, you have something better for me. And I have been... Um, I've, I've been digging in the dumpster for something good. And you have something much, much better than dumpster diving for me. Being honest with God. Aiming higher, it says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Don't make it a habit or pattern of life. I, that's why I'm writing this to you, because there is a better way. But if anyone does sin, he's going to give us some answers to that. But it's not like this, this one. It, um, it says, it, it doesn't work that way, Mr. Markson. You're supposed to confess your sins. <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to be confessing other people's sins. We need to do our own work. This is what we do when we come together. Times in our quiet time, we do our God work. We come and we own it. And we receive his grace and forgiveness. And then we um, receive his insight about how we may live better and with him. So we need to be honest with God. And here's the promise. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. This word is a, a, a very rich one. It ta- it's, it's basically one who comes alongside you. Uh, the, the person who comes along, and it, it was used often in, in, um, in Paul's day, of a friend who would join you, for example, in a, in a court of law. And if there was a question about your character, 
they would bear witness about your character. And in this case, it says we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So, when we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to us about the truth of God. And that continues to happen as we walk in the light as children of light. But in this case, Jesus is bearing witness for our defense to God. He's pleading for God's help, the Father's help, and Father, the Father's um, understanding of our weaknesses. Who could, who could know better than someone who's been with us, walked and lived as we do, and yet without sin? And he speaks to the Father in our defense. He's on your side. Even in your brokenness, even in when you blow it and you feel like I just can't get up and do it again, it's breaking my heart. It must break God's heart. Get up again. He's bearing witness for you to the Father. He's pleading your case. He speaks present active. He's doing this all the time for you and for me, pleading our case to God. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He's the one who can help us begin again. And he's not only that, he's not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, it might have seemed a little diff different that um, I would have talked about the love of God at the beginning of the service and saying, and having a message about sin. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that, that those two things go together in your mind, but I do, I do wish them to come closer and closer and closer in your mind. That he has, he has thoroughly weighed in on your side. That's what it's about. He's weighed in on your side. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said in his book, Life Together, about how important it is sometimes to find that uh, friend again, Brenda, that you mentioned. There are times when if we can't get a handle on our own brokenness, that sometimes that friend can minister the grace and forgiveness of God to us. And that's why it says, confess your sins to one another and pray that you may be healed. It doesn't have to be clergy who do it. It's your brother and sister in Christ whom God has called to be a priest or priestess to you. There are times, however, we feel alone in our brokenness. There are times when we, it's hard for, for it to sink into us even though we pray and we worship and we fellowship. We may feel like we are lonely in our uniqueness. But the fellowship of one another as believers is most important not only as devout people but as 
a fellowship of the undevout because that's what we are. In a sense, I love this phrase. The pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. So everyone has to conceal themselves from fellowship. We dare not be sinners or found out to be sinners. So we remain alone in our sin, living, well, lies. I mean, the fact is, we're, if we just come, come to it and say, yeah, I, that's what I am, and I am going to be healed and helped from God. So, dear ones, brothers and sisters, Peter says you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. There are times when we bear witness of God's grace and forgiveness to each other. I'd like to pause for a brief time here. Um, and, and, and reflect. And then we'll sing a song about fellowship. This is part of our fellowship, this subject that I've been covering this morning. This is part of our fellowship. We fellowship around this. What do we hold in common? <laughs> we hold in common a Savior. We also hold in common that we are in process. We are in process. Let's bow.
here in your presence, Father, with obedience heart, hearts, we confess our brokenness and our sins before you so that we can receive your forgiveness. You know us so well. You know how easy it is for us to pretend what accomplished hypocrites we can be, how practiced we are in the simple art of self-deception. You know we've grown up this way. The world around us lives on this level. When we come to you, Father of Light, we realize how important it is to take down those defenses and just be with you and know that you have such great desires for us to fit us for your kingdom, uh, to give us life, brand new and distinct and fresh life. So we are here to lose this pretend status and receive the rightful one, that we are your children, cleansed and made pure by your dear son. And we pray for healing. Holy Spirit, fall on all of us. Heal the inner wounds of soul and heart and mind, which our own sinfulness has caused. Heal us now that we're clean. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Before we go, uh, and as the last thing, I'd like to sing a little song together. It's about fellowship, and it's in your honor, Travis, that I have included this. So know that you're in our thoughts as you go, okay?
God be 